introduce Dr. Rama Vasudevan, who is a R&D staff scientist and data analytics coordinator at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Dr. Vasudevan has completed his PhD in material science and his focus was on scanning probe microscopy of ferroelectric materials and he got this in 2013 from the University of New South Wales. So since he has become a staff member at Oak Ridge in 2016, his focus has been on marrying machine learning methods with principles of statistical physics so that he can understand the microscopic mechanisms that govern materials phenomena. His current research interests include ferroelectrics, scanning probe microscopy, and reinforcement learning for material synthesis applications. For his work, he has won the Oak Ridge Postdoctoral Researcher Award in 2015, particularly for atomic scale electrochemistry. So he has published over 70 peer review publications, and it's a pleasure to have him talk to us today about the intersection of machine learning and material science. Let's give him a warm welcome. And Dr. Vasudevan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dirisha. It's, uh, it's fantastic to present here. I thank you for the opportunity um, to give the seminar. I will talk to you today about machine learning for material science, um, and in particular for imaging and for material synthesis. So a lot of this is a collection of work that we've been doing for the past three to four years at the Center for Nanophase Material Science at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the people involved with this work. So it's not just myself, but uh, we've had a lot of students, postdocs, and colleagues uh, who have helped greatly um, in doing the work that I'm going to show you today. So uh, in particular, I would like to thank Nick Bardino, who is now at Siemens, but who was a postdoc at CNMS. Uh, who did a lot of the deep learning work that I'm going to show you today. Mark Oxley, who is a, a physicist and a simulations expert, who did many of the simulations work that I will show you. My colleagues at CNMS, including Sergey Kalinin and Stephen Jesse, um, as well as uh, Suha Somnath uh, and many others uh, from the AI initiative, such as Dan Lou, Laura Pullum, and David Womble, who heads the AI initiative. I should mention the AI initiative is also uh, one of the funders for some of the work that we've been doing in reinforcement learning. Talk to you about that at the end of this talk, um, as well as many others. But in, uh, in closing, I'd definitely like to thank the Department of Energy um, for their funding, um, without which none of this work will be possible. So I'm from the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences, which is actually the smaller building here. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, so uh, if I was at work, I would be in this particular uh, room right here. Um, it's, a, it's a building that's connected to the Spallation Neutron Source, which is a world-renowned neutron science facility, um, which is shown on the left here. Uh, and so uh, we are one of five national nanoscience research centers within the United States. So there's only one, they're all, there's, there's a few, but the major uh, neutron facility in the United States is this particular neutron facility. And each uh, major light source or neutron facility is paired with a nanoscience research center. Um, and in this case, uh, we are at that particular nanoscience research center. Um, and it works pretty similar to many other uh, large user scale facilities. You submit proposals, uh, they get peer reviewed, and then uh, you get staff scientists to help you to perform your experiments um, and provide their expertise. So with that said, uh, we're in a particularly interesting age as far as material science is concerned. Um, we have a huge bunch of challenges, uh, not limited to COVID-19, but also we have challenges in energy, in climate change, and so forth. And for a lot of these challenges, uh, we can probably uh, attempt to tackle them, at least in a substantial way, um, through advances in material science. So can we have better photovoltaic materials to improve their efficiency? Can we create better sensors for self-driving cars? Can we create better electronics, which can work at much lower power? Right? Can we create better battery storage by working on, on electrolytes? Um, all of these are really underpinned by fundamental material science. So if we can make dramatic progress in, in fundamental material science, we should be able to tackle many of these challenges. And, and they really present a tremendous opportunity for any budding material scientists um, uh, in this day and age. So the, the real problem, though, is that we are demanding more and more of our materials. So in previous years gone by, we might say that we want a material to only, to only have a certain uh, 
uh, type of application. But what we are demanding right now is we are demanding uh, materials which are quite complex uh, that can have uh, quite a number of different functionalities in them. And this actually makes our task of developing new materials substantially more comp uh, complicated. And so this is where we think machine learning can actually have a, a, an important uh, role to play in trying to navigate this parameter space. So, uh, machine learning in material science is actually not new. It has quite a long history. And in fact, if you go back all the way to the 90s, uh, you will see applications of neural networks for uh, various problems in, in material science. Um, but uh, in general, I would say that the applications of machine learning in material science have kind of gone uh, just as the field of AI has gone. In other words, there's kinds of peaks and troughs. Every time there's a dramatic increase in funding in AI, um, then there's also, a, there's also a corresponding increase in adoption of these uh, techniques by other domain scientists. And so as that has increased uh, in the last five years, you have seen a dramatic increase in the prevalence of machine learning methods in material science. And I'm really sitting at that particular junction right now, um, myself and my colleagues at CNMS and at Oak Ridge, where what we are trying to do is we are trying to capitalize on the gains in machine learning and, and data that have been that are present uh, to try to uh, advance material science. So you can see that uh, in 2001, there was a materials research uh, society uh, symposium. So this is the premier material science conference in the world, uh, which was de dedicated to combinatorial and artificial intelligence methods in material science. So I don't want you to get the impression that this is somehow new. It's been going on for the last 20 years. However, it's recently picked up a lot of steam, uh, largely because of two things. One is the materials genome in initiative, so some of you may be uh, familiar with that. This was started under the Obama administration, but it was a, an initiative to try to uh, increase the rate at which new materials are both discovered as well as uh, applied um, in industry. And so uh, that actually led to a dramatic increase in the amount of data, in particular things like density functional theory calculations for predicting new materials. And so this actually gave us these kind of libraries that we can mine with machine learning to try to predict new materials and try to understand their properties. The other thing that's uh, kind of important to note is that almost every user facility is dealing with a data deluge. And I'll, I really don't need to ex uh, expand on this. Uh, suffice to say, if you look at this plot, for example, and this plot only goes up to 2016, and it's only particular to our, to our group at CNMS, you can see that the data volumes that we're collecting in any one type of, of experiment are just exploding. And so our traditional methods of data analysis, um, which might have relied on, you know, functional fits to a, a one or a few curves, is no longer really valid once you start to deal with data by, with experiments that go into terabyte ranges. Um, and so you need to think about uh, data science practices just to visualize what's going on here. So um, with that said, I think there is still a missing piece, and that is we are still missing a lot of data that will be necessary to be able to move towards a paradigm where uh, we can really apply uh, the methods of machine learning um, to dramatically accelerate material science. So I mentioned in the last slide that we do have data, but unfortunately, a lot of that data is still stored on local, local storage. It's not shared with other people. It's not disseminated. And most importantly, it's not labeled. So uh, even though we, we, have, we are generating large amounts of data, we are still missing uh, substantial labeled data sets in order for us to be able to apply the, especially the deep learning methods, but even standard machine learning methods to be able to advance our science. And I've, I've, I've written a little bit about this in a perspective that we published in MRS Communications last year, and I encourage you to, to read it. But basically, uh, if we have uh, data, then we can actually, um, and we integrate tools correctly um, with different types of libraries. So for example, if we have combinatorial libraries, imaging libraries, where we have uh, data of atomic resolved images, uh, and we have uh, our access to theory databases, we can combine them together in an integrated sense and really come up with, with methods for advancing material science. So in, uh, with that introduction done, I'd like to start with uh, you know, what I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm going to focus on three separate areas. The first is going to be about how we can accelerate imaging with Bayesian methods. Um, this is work that we did um, in conjunction with, a, with a, a former colleague at ORNL who is now, who is now a statistics professor at the University of Manchester. Um, the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about statistical and deep learning in materials imaging. And um, this is really uh, how we can use machine learning for tackling inverse problems. Um, it's kind of a 
hot area right now. And the third uh, aspect is work that I've been doing in the AI initiative, which is basically how we can advance material synthesis with reinforcement learning. Um, so uh, I would like, I guess, uh, um, if you have questions at the end of any one of these sections, it might be a good I idea to ask at the end of uh, any of these sections rather than waiting right till the end. Um, that's just my personal preference. So let's start with uh, the first section on how we can accelerate imaging. So I'm actually a microscopist by training, and we deal with scanning probe microscopy typically, which means that we have a tip at the end of a cantilever. And then what we usually do is we apply some kind of stimulus to the tip, and then we measure a functional response of the material at some, at some particular position. So in this case, we have a tip. It might be a scanning tunneling microscopy tip or an atomic pulse microscopy tip. In any case, it's electrically conducting, and we can apply a potential to it. Um, and then we can either have it in tunneling uh, or in tunneling mode or in contact with the sample. Uh, and then we can measure the current that flows through the, uh, through the sample as a function of this voltage. And we have some kind of readout. So at any one position, as we sweep this voltage, we end up with these kinds of curves. These are called IV curves. And this is a technique that's widely used and it has been used for 25 to 30 years um, in order to map the electrical properties of materials at the nanoscale. So you can get really down to atomic resolution um, with STM or scanning tunnel microscopy. Uh, and that's uh, kind of more, more or less routine. So you, if you repeat this kind of uh, spectroscopy over a grid of points, as shown here, you will build up a map. And so what you'll eventually get is you'll get these voltage slices. In other words, the current at different voltage levels. And you'll build up this kind of hyperspectral, if you will, data set uh, that, you can, that you can analyze. And so this is a technique that has been widely used. And this is kind of the state of the art for nanoscale electrical property mapping. Uh, there is one particular problem with this technique, however, and that is that it's a typically slow process. It takes several hours uh, in order to create a good a scan of good density. Now, if you think about that, uh, if, if we're going to spend several hours uh, to create a scan, which in this case might only be a few nanometers across, let's say 20 nanometers across by 20 nanometers, then your system has to be extremely stable in order for this to work. Otherwise, you'll get dramatic drift, and so you won't be able to correlate the, 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 the atomic positions or the microstructural features of the sample with the electrical properties. And so we want to be able to, to either minimize the drift or accelerate this kind of imaging. So we try to work on accelerating the imaging. So the first question you have to ask is, why is this process so slow? Why does it take several seconds in order to capture some of these IV curves? And the answer is actually quite trivial. So anybody who's done um, anything with electronics knows about RC circuits. So what we actually have is we have a parallel, a parallel RC circuit. We have a, a material which has some kind of resistance. resistance. It's a nonlinear resistance, with a, as, so it varies as a function of voltage typically. We have some capacitance which comes from a measuring circuit, which we typically don't know very well. And what we do is we have a voltage that we apply to our sample, and we have a current that we measure. And so this is the standard equation that you get you know, from, from RC circuit theory about uh, what is the current that you're going to measure. The current that you're going to measure is a material property, but it also has a contribution from the measuring circuit. And so we want to be able to minimize this particular contribution from the measuring circuit uh, by basically trying to set it to zero. And how can we do that? Well, if you make this derivative term go to zero, then we'll be mi minimizing this particular contribution. So how this is done in practice is uh, you can kind of see this here. It's done by stepping a waveform um, in terms of the DC voltage and then applying a delay time before you actually start acquiring current. So after every time the DC voltage, voltage is stepped, there's a particular delay time, T1, and then you integrate between times T1 and T2 uh, in order to capture what is the steady state current. So you minimize, minimize this parasitic capacitance contribution. Okay, so this is fine. That works really well. However, it's slow because now you have uh, both an integration time and, and then you also have a delay time. And these are, have to be typically on the order of milliseconds. And so when you have many of these voltage steps, uh, it kind of adds up and then you end up having to spend at least half a second or one second to capture a single IV curve uh, with a sufficient resolution. So we looked at this and said, how about we change, we change the way we're doing this? How about we, we instead uh, instead of applying this kind of DC voltage, how about we apply an AC voltage instead at some particular frequency? Can we get away with it? So as it turns out that you actually can. So let's say that we have a voltage which is a sine wave at some particular frequency. 
we can rewrite the equation on the previous page like this. Um, we basically uh, write this uh, as some kind of linear, the linear, uh, linear sum, where this S term is uh, given by a, a set of basis functions. Uh, I won't go through the details here. They're kind of in this paper. It's actually fairly trivial linear algebra. Um, but effectively, what we're doing is to say that if, given that we know the model, right, given that we know that we have a model of the circuit, right, we should be able to infer what the capacitance contributions are from the, from the data itself. And so this is a Bayesian inference problem, and you can set it up like this. And so this, is, this was work done by Cody Law, where when we went to him and said, this, this is our circuit equation, can you help us out? And so uh, he came up with this uh, approximation um, for what we are seeing. And it turns out it works really well, right? So what you can do is this is just showing you how it works in practice. So this is a sample. It's a, a ferroelectric nanocapacitor. It's not particularly important. Um, what you see here is uh, you see these little uh, uh, islands. And so these are actually little capacitors. So they're, they're basically metals. Uh, this is copper, actually. These are copper electrodes. And so um, underneath that copper is a ferroelectric material. And so it has some level of electrical conduction, which is nonlinear um, in terms of it it, in its dependence with the voltage that you apply. So if we, if, we, if we perform our standard IV measurements on this particular sample, and we look at a, at a, a particular voltage slice, you will see that a, some of the capacitors have higher current densities than others. Um, this is to be expected because of different defect concentrations. If you look at a particular single point, I can look at the IV spectrum at this point, and you can see that it has very little current on the positive voltage side and some substantial current on the negative side. It's still not large. It's only on the order of half a nanoamp, but it's large enough to measure. Okay. Here's the key point. This particular experiment, in order for us to get this spatial map, took us about two hours to complete. The other thing is that we know that these materials are ferroelectric. In other words, they have an electrical polarization that can be switched by applying electric fields. When you switch electrical polarization, you should create a displacement current, and this displacement current should be measurable on the scale that we're talking about here. However, in these measurements, we are not able to capture this displacement current. So why is that? The reason for that is because, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, there's a delay time when you do the standard measurement. This delay time is basically where the switching is taking place, and we are missing it because our temporal resolution is not sufficient in this particular technique. However, uh, if we instead uh, apply a different method where instead of applying the standard DC waveform, we apply an AC voltage, in this case at 200 hertz, right? what, do we actually, what do we actually see? So what we actually measure at a single point is shown here. We have this uh, giant loop that's shown here. And at, at first you might think, well, this is bad. It doesn't look anything like the IV curve that we should be measuring on the sample. And that's correct. However, because we are applying our uh, sinusoidal voltage, what we are uh, also measuring is we are also uh, beset by this capacitance contribution. But we have a model for this, right? We have a model of the circuit, and so we can actually try to infer what the capacitance is from this data itself and using that model with Bayesian inference. So we can subtract this uh, uh, capacitance contribution, and what we are left with is we are left with the IV curve for both forward and reverse traces. So what you see here is you see the same kind of, uh, of behavior, but you also see uh, that, that we saw here in this uh, standard measurement, but you also see the addition of this uh, displacement current contribution that we could not see in the standard measurements. So in other words, we are able to both measure the ferroelectric properties of the sample, which we are not able to measure in the standard measurement because now we have appropriate temporal resolution. And uh, additionally, uh, we, are, we actually have uh, substantial increases in, in, the, in the efficiency or the speed at which we can perform this measurement. So this particular measurement took 15 minutes to complete, and uh, instead of having a spatial map which had this resolution, we have a spatial map which has substantially greater resolution. So just by applying a model and accelerating our imaging by applying a different waveform, we are able to dramatically increase uh, the speed at which we can acquire this data by a factor of 10 to 100 times. The only downside is that now we have to perform a Bayesian inference on every curve, um, but uh, uh, the nice thing about that is that even when we do that, uh, we actually still maintain, because it's a Bayesian model, we can still maintain uncertainties in our reconstructions for the resistance as a function of voltage, which at the end of the day is what we are trying to do. So what I want you to get out of this is that by applying you know, a very standard uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian inference technique, we are able to accelerate our imaging in microscopy by a factor of 10 to 100 times.
and without any loss of resolution. In fact, with a gain in resolution, both temporal space and in spatial, uh, in spatial scale. Um, and just to show that this can actually be useful to learn some physics, uh, you can start to look at these tails that you get from the current, uh, from the displacement currents that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, long tails basically mean more disorder in the switching process. It, it's not particularly important in this particular in this talk, but uh, I can you can read the paper if you if you're more interested. But basically, this allows us to extract more physics from our measurement than we would otherwise have been able to do with our standard technique. So that's that, uh, for the first part, are there any questions on that? I believe there was one question from Salvador, but he said he understood it. I think the question was, what about retrospective analysis of previous data set to test the AI to reproduce analysis output? Uh, okay, so in this case, um, the, uh, the acquisition is different. And so uh, the two, we created a completely different acquisition mode, um, but, uh, but in principle, um, if we had this acquisition mode for, for previous data sets, we could apply the same technique. And because it's a statistical learning uh, algorithm, uh, it doesn't actually require training data sets. So it's not, it's not a machine learning supervised machine learning approach, if, if, that, if that clarifies things. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's good, I think. Okay, okay. so, uh, okay, I see he says understood, great. Uh, so, the, so the next top part of my talk is about uh, statistical and deep learning in materials imaging. And I was a little bit reluctant to do this, to be honest, uh, when we first started deep learning, because, uh, you know, I was, uh, like many people, I was a little bit skeptical about how much we could actually use it for advancing our imaging purposes. I was a bit unsure, let's say. And I had a postdoc, um, uh, maybe, sorry, i come back here. I had a postdoc who was working on, on deep learning and very interested in machine learning. He's also a material scientist. And he said, Rama, I want to learn about deep learning and deep neural networks a little bit more. So I said, okay, how about we use neural networks uh, as what they were really designed for, which is um, as function approximators, right? So at the end of the day, the neural network is nothing but a function approximator um, to, to be simplistic about it. Uh, and so uh, the functions that we work with typically in, in microscopy, um, being an atomic force microscopist, are something like a, this particular model here, a simple harmonic oscillator model. So this is a model which is basically given for an, an oscillator, which is in a, in a harmonic approximation. You have a tip, so this is uh, an atomic force microscope at the end of a cantilever. We bounce a laser off the end of the cantilever, it goes to a photodetector, and we measure the response of this cantilever to different perturbations. So as we scan across a sample, for instance, and apply a voltage. Uh, and so when you Fourier transform this, you get the response in frequency space. So this is either real and imaginary, or you get amplitude and phase. So this is real and imaginary, this is amplitude and phase. I apologize about the, the scale missing here, but this should be phase and phase. Um, but uh, this is a, a typical example of, a, of a, uh, a spectrum that we capture from our experiment. And we fit this uh, data to this particular model to extract relevant features, including the amplitude the oscillation, the quality factor, in other words, uh, kind of the, the, the width here, uh, full width half maximum, if you will, um, the resonant frequency, the frequency at which this resonance is maximum, um, uh, as well as the, the phase of the oscillation. So this is dependent on, on, on your drive. So uh, this is a very simple least squares fit that we can do to this data. It's a very simple model. Um, it's, you know, it, it accepts a complex input. And what we want as an output is we want uh, we want these four parameters of this particular model, right? It's very straightforward, and then anybody with you know basic program programming can uh, can come up with a least squares method uh, to solve for this. So what we wanted to do is to say, okay, is there any point in using neural networks which have typically hundreds of thousands of parameters as opposed to this standard least squares algorithm um, to fit this simple harmonic oscillator equation? And so. The nice thing about having forward models which are analytical is that we can generate data uh, as much as we like. So uh, what Nick went ahead and did um, is that he created this simple deep neural network, and it's really simple in the sense that it's not comp it, it, it's not particularly large. Um, it has two uh, channels of input, a real part and an imaginary part, because our function is complex. And as the output, it's only going to have the four parameters that we care about, the amplitude, the phase, the quality factor, and the resonant frequency. 
And so you can go ahead and train this model on simulated data. But because you can train it on simulated data, uh, you can train it um, for various different noise levels, right? So maybe this can be quite useful because neural networks tend to be pretty, pretty robust uh, when it comes to uh, noise as long as they're fed enough data. And because data is not a limitation in this case, because we have a forward model, we can continue to train for as long as we like. So as it turns out, least squares feeding that we have been applying for, for our functions, sorry, for our data, uh, is actually remarkably uh, dependent on the initialization, right? And this kind of makes sense. If your initial initialization or your prior for your least squares fit is poor, then you might get trapped in some kind of local, uh, local minima and not be able to reach the global solution. And so what we found out was that by using the deep neural network, you actually get substantially better priors. So here is just an example of simulated data and where we showed this particular uh, particular case. So this is the phase of the response. And in this, oops, I'll go back. Uh, you can see that it's kind of got, uh, uh, you know, plus or minus uh, uh, pi radians in terms of the phase. And so as you go down this simulated image, you have decreasing amplitude. In other words, it will become more and more difficult to reconstruct the uh, the phase as you go down this particular image because you the signal to noise ratio is reducing. If we apply our standard least squares uh, least squares algorithm to try and fit for the phase, you can see that you know initially it's fine as the signal to noise is high, but as the signal to noise gets uh, gets worse, uh, it it it's, it fails rather readily um, uh, and rather quickly to be honest. And so once you go down to to the worst cases, it cannot reconstruct this phase at all. On the other hand, when we use that deep neural network for, for fitting this particular phase, you can see that it maintains performance even well, uh, well below the line at which the least squares fit starts to fail. So what this is showing is that the deep neural network is remarkably good uh, in high noise environments uh, at coming up with what the phase actually is uh, rather than the least squares algorithm. However, now you might say, okay, but that's a little bit uh, uh, you know why that's working and and i think the reason why that's working is that the deep neural network is working as a better estimator uh, in terms of the prior so if we feed the deep neural network's output into a least squares algorithm as the prior we actually get the we actually get a a, a, a improved result for both high signal to noise regions and low signal to noise regions so what this is what this is saying is a deep neural network is effectively operating as a good guesstimator, right? It can look at a spectra even if it's particularly noisy and guess what the solution is, and then this can then be used as the seed for some kind of optimization algorithm like the, uh, like the LM algorithm for uh, uh, for finding out what the numerical solution actually is. Um, and just to show that this is not just for simulated data, it actually works in practice. You can see an example for an, an, an imaging problem where, where what we do is we vary the voltage that we are applying. In other words, we, we vary the signal to noise ratio. So what we would like to do is we would like to maintain imaging quality at very low excitation voltages. Because for, for example, for some material systems, we don't want to uh, stress them by applying voltages that are beyond the voltage stability window for them, for example, battery materials. Um, if we go to very low excitation voltages, uh, it turns out that, you know, as expected with the standard least squares method, you can't really see much detail. And this is just because the signal to noise is really, really, really low. Um, however, if we use our hybrid approach where we use the deep neural network uh, as a seed for the least squares algorithm, you can see that, in fact, even at the lowest excitation voltage, we are able to um, discern some features in this image. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that we, uh, we actually have a lot more information in our images than we are actually utilizing. Um, and the reason for that is really because if we don't have good estimates and we don't have good priors, uh, then we're not going to uh, be able to extract the maximum amount of information that we can um, from, from the imaging data that we're collecting. So this is kind of just a window into what we are missing as uh, microscopists uh, by not using on more some of these techniques. I think they can be really powerful. Um, but that was just a simple example in, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, an analytical equation. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's widely applicable as long as you have analytical equations and forward models, which are simple to compute. But uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, you actually don't have that. And so what you need to do is you need to create large libraries of stimulated data sets. And so uh, one of the typical problems that material scientists have is trying to determine structure from diffraction images. 
So here's an example of a diffraction image that comes from a, a, a electron microscope. This is convergent beam electron diffraction. You have a sub angstrom probe. Um, these are basically electrons that have been focused. Uh, you have some kind of sample. And then as you scan this probe across, you'll get a, a collection of diffraction patterns. So what you have here is actually a four dimensional data set. As you scan across this particular sample, you have diffraction patterns. So you have X, Y, and you have UV. So this is in diffraction space or in K space. And uh, this is in real space. And so every time you perform this measurement, you have this large four dimensional data set. And the, the question is, can I learn something about my material system by looking or inspecting these diffraction patterns? And this is what typically is done in crystallography. Um, it's a field that's been around for more than 100 years. However, it's rather difficult for, for systems like this because uh, you have to consider dynamical scattering uh, for electron beam diffraction um, in, in this particular case. And so you need to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation, time-dependent Schrodinger equations, and it's uh, rather uh, rather expensive in, term, in, terms, uh, in terms of running the simulations. And actually computing the inverse is, is actually impossible, um, uh, certainly analytically, and even numerically, it's very, very difficult to compute the inverse uh, solution uh, to going from these diffraction patterns back to some descriptors of a particular sample. So what we decided to do is to say, can we use a deep neural network approach to help us in this particular inverse problem? So the particular inverse problem that we chose is uh, relatively straightforward. And it's shown here. Let's say I have a material system, strontium titanate, and then I have a material system, lanthanum aluminate. And this is basically just uh, strontium titanate and lanthanum aluminate and these are grown by some kind of layered, layered deposition approach. What you see is uh, in the middle, you have a, a titanium oxide layer, but this titanium oxide layer can actually be uh, uh, corrupted, if you will, by diffusion between the two different uh, material systems that are left and right. We wanna determine both the amount of diffusion as well as whether there is some kind of roughness in this interface uh, that is on along the Z direction. Um, in other words, along the, uh, sorry, along the probe direction. So we went ahead and simulated all of these different cases. We can simulate this diffusion and we can simulate whether there is some kind of roughness in terms of a buried step edge uh, for this particular system. And so it's shown here that where what we did ran uh, simulations for many, many different cases of a buried step at different positions and of diffuse out uh, of a diffuse interface for many different types of diffusion, uh, many, many different levels of diffusion. And this ended up being a, you know, a data set with basically terabytes of, of, of data, certainly hundreds of gigabytes, and but it's actually, we've updated it to include many more effects, so it gets to terabyte range now. Um, uh, so the, this is what a typical uh, diffraction pattern sequence looks like as you go across this interface for a diffuse pattern versus for a step pattern. You can see that you know, as, as you go across this interface, uh, you, you have differences in the diffraction pattern, but it's not at all clear what any of this means, even for experts, right? So if you look at this diffraction pattern, they, you can't look at this diffraction pattern and say, okay, I can clearly see that this, based on this diffraction pattern, there are features that tell me that the step is going to be halfway through the interface or three quarters of the way through the interface. It's really not possible to tell by looking at it by eye. So we decided maybe can we can train neural networks in order uh, to, to, to solve this particular task. But there, that, that actually leads to a particular problem. And the problem that it leads to is that we are training our neural network on simulated data. If your simulated data is not matching with experimental data, then you're not going to have particularly good results, right? So um, the reason for this is basically distributional shift. I'm trying to uh, solve for, I'm trying to train my model on some generative mo on some generative data that's come from a simulation, and then I'm going to apply it from uh, to some uh, simulated to some experimental data which is out here and comes from a different distribution. But what I really need to do is I really need to learn the mapping that comes from the simulated data to the experimental data. And that, that's also going to, uh, that's going to be useful because if I can map my simulated data to look like the experimental data, then I can train my model on this uh, mapped simulated data before I apply it to my actual experiment. And so when I was looking through the literature, it turns out there's this paper in 2018 called Cycle uh, Consistency Generative Adversarial Networks, which actually performed this kind of mapping um, uh, for you. I won't go into the details, um, but it uses generative adversarial networks in order to uh, convert things like Monet paintings into photos or zebras into horses. Uh, you're obviously not going to have actual photos of zebras that turned into horses, um, but this 
by learning on pictures of both zebras and learning on uh, pictures of horses, this network is able to convert one uh, to, to another and, and back again. And that's where the cycle consistency comes into, comes into play. Nonetheless, we thought, okay, this is really a good way to try to learn how our simulated data is different from our experimental data and then convert one to the other. Um, and so this is actually just an example of, of that in practice. Here's our experimental uh, diffraction pattern. This is what happens when uh, we make it look like it came from the simulated data. And then when we, when we turn it back again to uh, using the cycle consistency uh, feedback loop. And what you basically want is you want this, the loss between the experiment and this G of F of X to be minimized. Uh, and it kind of, uh, it, it seems to agree right now um, as you see these images. So anyway, when when uh, when we try and do this and when we apply it, it turns out that the method actually tends to work. So uh, we can apply this uh, cycle GAN um, in order to try and classify whether we have diffuse interfaces or whether we have stepped interfaces um, on our particular sample. And so it, this is a kind of involved slide, I won't go through it, but I just want to emphasize that by learning the appropriate, learning on the appropriate distributions, right? So by converting our data set to look like a simulated data set or the other way around, we can actually get substantially higher predictive accuracy for our deep learning models. This is something that's kind of particularly relevant for things like self-driving cars, where uh, they might have millions of hours logged um, in simulated environments, uh, but we need to make sure that they, those are representative of, of real environments. And so this can be a technique that can be quite useful in situations like that. Okay, um, I'm kind of, uh, that uh, ends that section. Are there any questions? Um, the, I think there, there was a couple of questions from Shiadu Wong. Probably the first question was related to the previous section, but I'll ask, I think his question was, are all data sets only from simulations? And I think you might have answered that. Um, so all your data sets are from simulations is a question. Yeah, so uh, our, our simulated data, I mean, obviously our model was trained on simulated data that was converted to look like experimental data based on, on, on the, the GAN or the generative, generative adversarial network that was, uh, uh, that was trained on a batch of simulated data, a batch of experimental data to learn that transformation. So in a way, uh, we are just augmenting or applying a transform on our simulated data that we learned from experiment. Are the simulated data sets um, we will make them publicly available um, uh, in the near future. So uh, there's already some simulated data sets available from Oak Ridge regarding seabeds. Um, they're about several terabytes in size. So those are actually already available um, from a colleague of mine. I can send you the link to those, but we will also publish these in due course. There's one more question. Um, how do you define the label from the experimental data? Oh, so we don't, we don't actually. So that's the thing. Um, uh, we we can't, right? So the purpose of the uh, experimental data is is we're trying to figure out if there is a step or not, or if there's a diffuse interface or not in the experimental data. And so the experimental data is unlabeled, and we apply our network, our trained network, in order to determine that. Um, the cycle GAN doesn't require uh, doesn't require labels other than to say which data is simulated and which data is experimental. So in that sense. Yeah, I mean, you could say that the data is labeled in terms of it's labeled as being from the experimental distribution, so. Yes, that, those are the questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so the, the last part is going to be about autonomous synthesis by reinforcement learning. Um, and I think this is the most exciting part because uh, one, of the, one of the challenges in material science is really material synthesis. So one area where we have been um, Kind of doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of research, uh, and certainly an area where I did my post postdoctoral research was in pulse laser deposition uh, of oxide materials. So this is a type of materials deposition technique where we shine we shine a laser, a pulsed laser, on a sample of interest or a target of interest, and what happens is that this generates a plume, the target material that propagates towards the heated substrate. And as you pulse this laser, you will deposit more materials onto the substrate and you can actually grow a film with, you know, atomic level uh, character. So you can do this in atomic layer by layer. 
uh, and you can change the type of material that you're growing. You can grow interfaces, you can grow super lattices, um, you can grow nanoparticles. There are a lot of different things that you can grow using this particular technique. And so it's really a powerful, versatile technique for uh, studying or and creating nanomaterials. The problem with this technique, however, is that it's kind of difficult to correlate the growth conditions with film properties because uh, if I have a set of growth conditions that work for my PLD chamber, they're not likely to work for another person's PLD chamber unless we have very rigorous calibrations. And those sometimes those calibrations are not even uh, perfectly uh, achievable for, for a variety of reasons. So the challenge here is reproducibility and trying to understand if I have a new material system that I'm trying to grow, how do I estimate the parameters of, uh, that I need to change in my deposition uh, to be able to achieve that particular desired materials outcome? And, and right now, I'm largely done in some kind of ser serendipitous approach. We basically run some kind of grid search on a parameter system, on a parameters uh, that we use, and then we uh, hopefully optimize based on some kind of uh, intuition that we have about our material system. And this is not, not at all ideal. And the reason it's not ideal is because it can take a long time to go from theory to actual discovery. So uh, as an example, about 15 years ago, there were a lot of studies published about some weird, some strange electrical topological orderings that were found in ferroelectric nano disks. So this is not, you know, uh, this is not a physics talk uh, per se, but what we are trying to do is we are trying to understand these novel topological orders in, in material systems. And the theory predicted that we should be able to observe them um, in uh, particular types of material systems, which we knew uh, existed in terms of you know, our ability to make them, but we didn't exactly know the parameters to choose and exactly how, uh, how to couple different materials together to observe these kinds of states. So uh, last year, uh, there was a pub paper published in Nature where they actually found that many of these predicted topological order ordered states did actually do actually exist in this kind of super lattice of strontium titanate and lead titanate. So the question you can ask is how come it took 15 years to go from a theory to an actual experiment which demonstrated this this thing actually exists? So we know that the theory is correct, right? There was nothing wrong with our theory. The problem was there was very little uh, insight to go how as to how to make the material systems that were being predicted by our theory counterparts. So our theory colleagues might say you should grow you could, you should grow this material system, but as an experimentalist, that doesn't uh, that's not particularly helpful if I don't already know have a recipe uh, for how to make this material system. I basically have to run a huge grid search, and I may never be successful, or I may be successful years down the line, or some lab in the world will be successful years down the line because they're really trying to uh, navigate a very large parameter space and they don't have much guidance. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the time it takes from going from a theory prediction to an actual experimental realization of that prediction. Um, and that's where reinforcement learning can actually come in. Of course, we need better models, but I think we have uh, much better models now than, than uh, uh, that can actually predict uh, you know, novel uh, non-equilibrium or metastable states. Um, and so we'll touch on that. So the traditional method of material synthesis goes like this, right? We have some kind of synthesis parameters that somebody gave us, or we just, you know, kind of go for our intuition. We synthesize a material, we characterize it, and then we go ahead and iterate. And this is a long process, right? There are many failures, it's intuition driven, and there's minimal information shared between, you know, different people. What about another method? Can we conceive of another method? And so this is what I call the digital. Maybe there's some kind of synthesis parameters that are suggested by some kind of model. It, it's probably not perfect, but it's going to be a place to start. Now we have a material being synthesized and potentially we can also have real-time diagnostics, right? As we are actually growing our film, we have information on the surface roughness because we have a uh, diffraction system that will produce diffraction images as a function of our growth, right? As a function of time. We can infer from this diff uh, our structure um, or our film that's being grown, and then we can infer properties of our film as a result. And this can actually lead to real-time feedback if we have an agent that can they can do this in real time. Can this agent uh, look at the real-time diffraction images and then say, okay, this is how the, the uh, parameters of our synthesis should be tweaked in real time to be able to optimize the material that's being synthesized. And what this should allow us to do is we should allow, it should allow us to reach the optimum material system much faster than the traditional method. Okay? What do we need for this? Well, what we need is we need reinforcement learning agents. And so reinforcement learning is a particular type of machine learning 
which deals with agents acting in dynamic environments um, based on uh, uh, rewards that they get from this environment. So the agent performs some, some actions, they have partial information on the environment, and the environment spits back uh, states. So in this case, for example, it will be the states of the material that you have, um, such as the surface uh, projections. And you, you also have rewards that are given out by the environment. So uh, we have some kind of objective that we're trying to reach and the re reward will be designed around this particular objective. And so the aim of the AI initiative was a five-year goal to develop data efficient and explorative and transferable agents to tackle scientific problems like this particular scientific problem. And now you might ask, well, is it possible to do this by human, right? Why do we need an, an artificial agent to do this? It turns out that humans can't inspect the diffraction patterns fast enough, right? In order to be able to come up with anything uh, realistically uh, to be able to apply for this particular problem. Um, and so the other problem is that this is a system where we have really sparse and delayed rewards. You don't really know what's going to happen until many steps down the line. So it's really a time sequence where an action that you perform now can have a very delayed reward. Uh, and humans are typically not particularly great at, at sensing this. Um, but even if they were, reading diffraction images is an art and we can't read diffraction images fast enough uh, in real time to be able to come up with uh, realistic policies uh, uh, for this particular task. And so that's where reinforcement learning really comes in. So I'm just gonna skip this next slide because I don't think it's important. But we went, we went ahead and created a simulated environment and uh, where we use a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation of a film being grown. This is just the one particular example. I hope you can see the film being grown here. Uh, we have a, a couple of different types of atoms uh, that, that are deposited on, on the surface. And the agent's goal is basically to minimize the surface roughness or to achieve a particular surface roughness um, by tweaking uh, different parameters. The parameters that they can tweak include temperature, which will affect diffusion rates, um, as well as deposition rates. So they can change the deposition rate of different atoms, atomic species, and they can change the temperature, which will affect the different diffusion rates. Uh, this is just another example of this particular environment of, a, of an agent taking random actions. And so the red and blue are two different types of atoms. The states are the surface projections. Um, and so these are, the, these are basically the control knobs. You change the temperature, you can change the deposition rate of atom type A, and you change the deposition rate of atom type B. And at the end of the day, you are trying to maximize the rewards, which are given by basically, the, uh, in this case, the surface roughness uh, being close to some kind of target value that we, that we are after. We can change this depending on what we are actually after, but we wanted to do a proof of principle to see if reinforcement learning will be relevant for this particular task. Um, uh, we used uh, as a first approximation a deep Q uh, learning approach. So we use a deep Q network, which consists of a few convolutional layers and a few dense layers. And this basically is uh, trying to learn what action uh, the agent should take based on repeated interactions with this environment, right? So that's how reinforcement learning typically works. It's, this is an online policy learning algorithm. Uh, so the agent will interact with the environment. It'll get some sequence of events and then it'll update the network uh, such that the uh, Q values, in other words, the states, uh, the, the projected, uh, I should say, depending on which state the agent is in, they will have a range of actions to take, and each action is associated with a particular Q value um, from reinforcement learning. So uh, you typically want to uh, choose actions which maximize your Q value because those are going to maximize the rewards down the line. Um, and so the, the deep Q algorithm uh, is a, an algorithm that's been used for things like uh, playing Atari games. And it was quite successful uh, back in 2015, 2016, when uh, some of the papers came out by DeepMind. So we use that approach and we find that actually it works remarkably well in the simulated case. So what I'm gonna show you here is the trained agent in terms of uh, the, uh, the performance of the trained agent over time um, for different iterations. So we can start the film with different roughness values. And that's kind of shown here, this is the start time. And as the agent uh, performs different actions, you can see that the, the roughness is starting to merge towards the target roughness. So regardless of where we start, the agent has learned a policy that is robust to the initialization and can result in the uh, film uh, being, uh, the final film being close to our target roughness. You can see this is not the case if you just take random actions. So the agent is definitely learning something. And you can also see the distribution of rewards um, based, on, uh, based on the final roughness is actually really, really nice. In other words, we're 
research on the proper solution uh, in this particular case. This is showing you how the, the states uh, progress over time and what actions are actually taken. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of nice just to visualize how your surface is changing and what actions they are taking over time. And in this case, it turned out that the agent was actually increasing the deposition rates, but also increasing the temperature um, uh, at all steps to be able to minimize the surface roughness to get closer towards this target value, as you would expect. Um, it also, uh, it's interesting to note what happens when uh, you force an extreme goal. So in other words, uh, there are certain states which are not reachable by, uh, depending on the initialization condition. Um, and what it turns out is that the agent still tries to get close to that um, uh, based on uh, based on our, exp our numerical experiments. So this is actually rather useful. We want because we don't know for sure when we run this when we run experiments whether our final state is actually achievable based on the action space that we are given. So you want be, you want to be at least close to that uh, target and not rather rather far away. To force these kinds of extreme goals. Um, but deep Q learning has a major flaw and, and the major or not flaw, but a major downside. And the downside is that it doesn't work for continuous action spaces very well. So you typically have to use policy gradient approaches. And so some of the uh, work that we've been doing within the AI initiative, and this is work with, with Dan Liu and, and colleagues, uh, is to use a so-called uh, policy gradient approach um, involving Stein variational policy gradient methods. So rather than learning one single policy, uh, that you can apply, we learn a distribution over policies, and this should make our system more robust. And this is particularly important for ex when you try to deploy this on experiment, right? So we, what we want to do is we want to have a distribution over policies that we are learning, and that's actually given by a Stein update. I won't go through this equation here. It's probably take me about 15 minutes to, uh, to go through it. Uh, but nonetheless, what it basically states is that you want to have different policies um, and the policy should both maximize rewards to some extent, but they should also repel each other so that you learn this distribution where some policies are going to be better for some so for some initializations and some policies are going to be different uh, better for others. But overall, you learn um, you learn a distribution over these policies and hopefully that will increase robustness and actually lead to better rewards over time. And so when we applied this, uh, we actually had to parallelize it. Um, we implemented it on GPUs and we ran it on a DGX box. Um, these are just kind of technical considerations, but we have an SVPG implementation that is parallelized. Um, and so this is, again, our environment that we also have open sourced, and this is available on my GitHub page. If you're interested, I can send a link, um, just send me an email afterwards, or I, maybe I'll put it on the chat window. Um, but what you can see here is that you can see that when we apply this method, we can actually achieve substantially better rewards over time compared to standard policy graded methods on our environment. So what is this saying? What this is saying that instead of learning one way to solve a problem, it is better to learn a distribution of ways, many different ways to, to solve a problem. Uh, and this kind of makes sense, right? So if you are if you want to make policies robust, rather than learning just one way to get from start to end, you want to learn many different ways to reach the end, reach the final conclusion. Uh, and so intuitively, it makes a lot of sense that this should be better than learning just a single policy at least in cases where you have uh, uh, substantially stochastic environments. Um, so th that's kind of the, the, the rub of reinforcement learning and, and as far as we are working in the AI initiative. Um, but I wanted to end with uh, kind of a note for where I see machine learning in material science more generally. Um, I don't think we can advance material science without uh, a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be created so that we can leverage a lot of the techniques that I've just talked about. We're not going to get very far if we don't have hardware and software infrastructure and the scientific data in place. We actually have uh, really good algorithms that we can apply, but in order for those to be applicable, we need to create this kind of scientific data ecosystem um, for the types of data sets that, that, you know, that scientists are interested in. These are not ImageNet style databases. These are not you know, MNIST. These are, these are data which necessarily are quite difficult to collect. They require specialized instruments. But we really need open science and we really need, need data sets to be opened and labeled in order for us to make progress um, uh, at, at a new type of uh, paradigm where we use data science approaches to advance uh, material science. Uh, I would like to just mention that I am from a user facility. So that means that if you're interested in any of this, uh, please come and talk to me. Um, you can collaborate by writing a user proposal and you can use any of the instruments um, that we have available, assuming that you have a approved user proposal. So 
very thankful for this opportunity. And I'm very happy to, say, to take any questions. Um, thank you, Rama. There are a couple of questions here. So from Randolph, this is more of a materials question. Does the epitaxial growth pattern depend on any extent on the transverse mode of the excitation laser? And if so, would incorporating this factor into your model improve its overall performance? Yeah, so um, there has, uh, so the, the laser is a pulsed laser and it's an excitement laser. Um, and so uh, depending on uh, the, uh, basically the, um, the laser uh, shape, um, the profile, the beam profile, and the laser energy, uh, you will get a different transfer. So a lot of uh, research has gone into understanding how beam profiles and how um, uh, your beam spot, your, your, how, how well you're focused on the target affects your stoichiometry. Um, so this is a fluence question. So it has a lot of influence, but uh, there are models for this, um, but they are not there. I wouldn't say that they're um, they're fantastic. Um, and typically, uh, they they're not um, they're they're not used by experimentalists to to gauge uh, the output of their uh, output of the of the of their different growths. So. Um, what is used instead is that you have uh, you, you you treat it like a black box. You have a control over the laser fluence, um, and you can look at the plume in real time using imaging, and you can adjust the fluence uh, depending on how your plume is looking and how your plume is behaving. Um, and you can use either a deep learning approach for this, or you can just use a standard computer vision methods uh, to be able to extract um, you know particular plume characteristics and see how they vary based on uh, your different uh, beam profiles and your different um, uh, laser fluences that you choose. So I would say, um, yes, that, that definitely has, a, has an impact, but it's more or less treated as a black box where you just tweak parameters in your growth. Thank you. Um, there's one more question. Uh, is the deep learning approach limited by the accuracy of simulation tools such as Monte Carlo method? Oh, absolutely. So um, the uh, the simulations are quite, uh, I mean, as far as the electron diffraction is concerned, um, uh, we know that for, uh, for convergent beam electron diffraction, the simulations that we have are relatively good for uh, thin specimens. So in other words, if your specimen is below 20 nanometers in thickness, or 40 nanometers in thickness, then uh, the approximations that are used in the simulation are more or less valid. And so we can get relatively good agreement between simulations and experiment. The challenge is the microscope parameters are unknown, right? So there are always some certain microscope parameters um, and this results in kind of feature, feature blurring um, or, or image blurring. And so uh, you can also simulate for this uh, or you can learn it directly. Okay, um, one more question. Since your RL is based on your simulation data, how do you guarantee your simulation environment is close to real-time scenario? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, so all, everything that we've done in RL for material synthesis is right now in the simulated environment, and there's going to be a lot of um, there's going to be a lot of uh, adjustment uh, once you move to the actual uh, actual experimental setup. The the way that you would uh, adjust your simulated environment to agree with experiment, I think, would be uh, relatively straightforward. So the underlying simulation is a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, which has a few rate parameters, and you could fit these rate parameters to experiment. So what you could do is you could run a few uh, test depositions. So let's say that I run five or ten different depositions for a few different conditions, uh, and then I can then try to fit my kinetic Monte Carlo model based on what I what I actually observe from experiment. And once I do this, um, uh, you know, you'll be able to train your uh, reinforcement learning model on this uh, adjusted simulated environment and then deploy it uh, for, for the real case. Now, this is ideal, of course, because now you have to um, employ this fitting step. Um, there are ways to uh, attempt to do this uh, using first principles calculations. And so people have done this before. Um, but it's going to be quite difficult for uh, for many cases, even with first principles calculations, to do this uh, and try to extract some of these rate parameters. Um, they're not particularly well understood, and the model itself is 
largely, um, I would say, uh, it, it also has its own flaws. So, um, yes, adaptability of the RL uh, agent to real world environments is definitely something to be explored. So, um, there's, there has been work on adaptability of RL agents in different environments. Um, and like, for example, single shot learning in a new environment, for example. Um, and so those are areas where we would have to, uh, we would have to learn uh, what is the best policy given a single example in a new, uh, in a new environment. Thank you. I had one last comment on your uh, reinforcement learning, Rama. Yep. You've mentioned you've used DQN. Uh, DQN is a good baseline agent, uh, but then there were follow up uh, algorithms that came from DeepMind which kind of address some of the concerns with uh, DQN, like asynchronous advantage actor critic networks. But in general, these types of networks have issues in um, how there is kind of a delay associated between the action and the actual reward. Um, and uh, they're also partially observable. So there is a new class of uh, algorithms in reinforcement learning um, which address some aspects of this. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to explore those or if you're thinking of it, uh, like hierarchical reinforcement learning algorithms. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I guess the, I've, I have not looked into hierarchical reinforcement learning. Um, I, I should mention the SVPG that we use is an actor critic algorithm. So uh, it does use uh, at least A2C um for uh for our svpg so um that's a lot of that's a lot of acronyms i guess um but but uh but we have um i agree i mean uh, i have played with a3c as well um uh but i i still i i'm i'm a big fan of of policy graded methods over over deep q learning because i think the the, the function the function approximation of deep q learning is is very difficult right so uh, as your Q function becomes more and more complicated, it, it really becomes um, more and more challenging. And uh, I found that it's uh, it 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 is quite sensitive uh, to your initialization and how you uh, so if you just use epsilon greedy approaches, for example, um, it can be quite uh, rather sensitive to your hyperparameter uh, hyperparameter selection as well. So um, yeah. Uh, I have not looked at hierarchical reinforcement learning. It's probably something that I definitely should do. Um, but but yes, I also know that uh, there is there has been very recent work um, from uh, uh, the, from DeepMind and and uh, the people who first created D DQN to address uh, the behavior to address the uh, continuous action spaces as well. So that's definitely something that that I would like to look into. Sure. Okay. Thank yeah. you. In the interest of time, um, we're going to wrap the presentation here. Thank you, Dr. Vasudevan, for a very inspiring talk and really highlighting how AI can help in advancing material science.